Um, just to let you know before we start, we are recording, so if you don't want to be um, recorded, then you can keep your microphone off and your um, video off throughout. Um, whilst we're doing the presentation, if you also don't mind keeping your video and your um, microphone off, um, and we can turn them on during the breakout sessions. Um, so my name is Sham, I'm a foundation doctor in London, and today I'm joined by Dr. Margaret Ikpo and Professor Mike Holmes. And this is part of the Influence in GP stream where we'll be talking about um, challenging racism in medicine and general practice and also um, how to be an ally. Um, we have a poll um, going up, a snapshot of the kind of people that are in the room. Um, um, so uh, the first question we have is, have you experienced any form of racism or microaggression in the workplace or um, at medical school or during placement? Um, and that's just a yes or no. Even if it was subtle, if you felt it, then it was real. Um, please choose yes. Um, and then if you have experienced that, did you report it? Uh, that's also a yes or no question. And then the third question is, um, whether or not you identify as a person of colour or an ethnic minority in this country, um, do you consider yourself an ally in terms of racism? If you can just answer that, we can um, gauge your answers. So obviously no one can see that you answered it. So if you can just answer, then we can get um, an idea of the people we have in the room. Okay, so 63% of you that answered said that you have experienced some racism or microaggression at work or at university and that's quite a large amount to be honest um, and then equally 54% of you that did experience this did not report it and then um, I just wonder if that's because you didn't know where to go or you didn't feel comfortable um, going to someone that's quite interesting and 63% um, of you identify yourself as an ally We'll be able to talk more about that um, later. So uh, we're going to move on to Dr. Margaret Ikpo now and we'll talk to you more about uh, racism in general practice. Uh, thank you, Sham. Um, so I'm Margaret. I'm a GP um, in Hull. Uh, I'm also a GP trainer and one of the associate medical directors for Hull York Medical School. Um, so thank you very much for coming along to this workshop. Um, and we will be discussing not just racism in medicine, but racism in general practice. Um, I started with this slide, uh, which was a groundbreaking British Medical Journal issue. I think it was February or March of last year. And the whole issue, which was a special issue, was addressed, was addressing racism. Why do we need to address it? And the poll results are, are, are absolutely uh, fascinating and possibly a little bit worse than what's been surveyed. So the Equality and Human Rights Commission found that a half of all students from um, ethnically diverse communities in the country experienced um, racism since they've started their course. Oh. So that could be um, a racist name calling or insults or jokes, um, not just from your fellow um, colleagues, but also from tutors. And the BMA survey, specifically for medical students, found that um, ethnically diverse um, communities, uh, so students from those communities, uh, if you know, I try not to say the word BAME um, for various reasons, um, students were four times more likely to have felt bullied or harassed and actually were very were less likely to even report it. Um, and that's quite consistent with what we've just polled now. Um, and examples that were given um, for medical students were that we've, we've had reports from uh, students who've come through what we call the widening participation program, which some of you might be aware of, and other students, um, white students, who um, will diminish um, their achievements by saying, oh, you only got here because you're poor and black. So um, we've got lots and lots of evidence that this is still happening, unfortunately, in 2021. Um, and it's important because 40% of our graduates uh, across the board are from ethnically diverse communities. And um, Professor Wolf and others have done a lot of work in looking at the educational attainment gap. Um, and whilst it's acknowledged that the exams aren't particularly biased and um, not racist, um, there's a lot of 
things that contribute to why the gap between the average attainment for a white student is different for an Asian or black student. So uh, next slide, please, Louise, thank you. So how does it affect us? I mean, um, there's, there's not enough time to go into how it affects us in, 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 as students. We all hear, there was a bit, you might be aware of a, a survey that was done where medical students felt that we experience pain three or four times um, less than, you know, when I say we black or Asian uh, patients experience it less than white, our white counterparts do. We've got historical trials, whether it's Tuskegee or Henrietta Lacks, um, there's lots and lots of evidence that we've got where um, racism is, is evidence in, the, in, in education. If you haven't seen um, the report by, I think she's still a student, she may have just qualified as a doctor, Olamide Dada. So some of you might be familiar with her. She's the founder of Melanin, Melanin Medics. She has just re um, released a report on pulse oximetry and um, health and how it's um, underreporting um, the oxygen saturations for black and Asian patients. And obviously that's got a lot of consequences in terms of how we're dealing with COVID. Um, I'll try and find the link and put it up somewhere at some point, if that's okay. Um, and how does it affect our patients? So there's so many different examples, whether it's infertility in black women because of problems in access, accessing healthcare, um, impact of racism on our mental health. We have evidence that people who are alone and in the last year in particular, um, they're becoming depressed and anxiety and anxious and losing hope in the system actually, um, because it feels like every system is against them. And there was a really good study that was done in North Carolina, which looked at why black infants were dying so much more than white infants. But we have our own evidence here in the UK. So if anyone's free on Monday at eight o'clock, I'm not affiliated with the programme in any way, Channel, Channel 4, I think it is, will be looking into why black mothers die five times more um, than, than white um, mothers in childbirth. And actually, this is shocking. This figure is actually much better than it was a decade ago where, when it was 10 times more. Um, so next slide, please. So what are the issues that we're facing? Um, now, there's a lot of debate about what we call the unconscious biases and conscious biases. We're, we are all biased to some degree. So that's a really important thing that I need to address. But it's acknowledging those biases. And there's a really good implicit bias tool that you can just Google implicit bias. And it will take you to a Harvard website where we, you can look at your biases, whether it's um, a bias against a particular race, or um, I had someone who did it the other day and she said, oh my God, I'm, I'm biased against um, people who are overweight. So it's a really interesting tool that you can use. Um, microaggressions.com, um, if you're not sure what microaggression is, um, I'm not going to go into that too much at the moment because we've got a really good case that we're going to discuss in the breakout rooms um, with regards to this. But all these things um, lead themselves, lend themselves rather to what we call weathering on our systems because it just wears us down. Um, and even just the frank racism is, is, is enough to drive us to despair because it will affect your physical and mental well-being at some point. So this is why I'm completely passionate about addressing this in practice. I'm hoping that I would never have to deliver a workshop about racism in the workplace um, next year, but I know deep down that, you know, it's, it's not gonna go away for, for a long time. So next slide, please. Sorry, Louise or Sam, next slide, thank you. So I've used the theme that we use for International Women's Day, Choose to Challenge. We have to speak out, we have to call it out. I think there's a much more um, um, emphasis on the collaborative effort. It's not just a, an Asian person's problem or a black person's problem, it's all our problem. You know, we, we all need to contribute to this problem and deal with it and, and actually be active bystanders and in dealing with that. And that's really good to know that a lot of you, 63%, I think it was, con consider yourselves to be allies. And so I'm going to leave that because Mike's going to talk about allyship shortly. Um, but it's really good to talk. So you'll all be too young to remember a really good advert that was done years ago. It was British Telecom by a comedian, Maureen Lipman. And she said, it's good to talk. And so I use the acronym, but it needs trust. We need to acknowledge the problem. We need to listen not just listen to respond but listen to understand um i had a student the other day from holland york who was a bit upset because one of her colleagues said to her oh black lives matter oh, yeah but that was last year and she was like no no i wake up black every day it's it's every day it's not just a last year problem um so that's really important to listen and knowledge we need to educate ourselves um so next slide please 
So I'll close with this quote by one of my um, all time favorites, Dr. Martin Luther King, who says, if I cannot do great things, I can do small things in a great way. And if we, even if we can do small things together collectively, we can achieve great things. And so I think that ties me nicely into um, um, handing over the mic to Mike. I like that, Mike to Mike, because he <laughs> has been able, he's been an absolute inspiration to a lot of GPs. He was our former vice chair for membership. And he was, he won't say this to you. That's why I'm just, I'm, I'm bigging him up now for, for, because I have to. He was involved in one of the, well, the first listing exercise, exercises for black GPs, um, which was done by our former president of the college a couple of years ago. And he's one of the strongest allies that we have. So over to you, Mike. Margaret, thank you so much. And uh, thank you for those kind words. Um, I was going to start by um, saying I'm not an expert in this area and I definitely I'm not. You know, I think um, what I want to do is help and support and, and celebrate difference. And I think that's part of what an ally means, really. And, and I also acknowledge that I don't get it right all the time. And I think that that reality that we have to continually learn is, is important. Um, if I can start by just directing you to the website at the bottom there, you know, there's a lot of material out there about what it means to be an ally. And I think this this website um, I thought was particularly good. And, and a lot of what I'm going to say you'll find on there um, when, you, when you get a chance to look. So what is what does it mean? Um, and, and I think it means a number of things, but um, it's certainly about educating yourself. Um, you know, it shouldn't be up to other people, particularly from ethnically diverse communities, to educate you. So um, read about it, learn about it. There's a really good reading list on, on that website. You know, books, articles, um, news, news um, reports. Um, but it's also OK to talk and it's also OK to ask questions and be curious and try to understand and to listen. What are people from ethnically diverse communities saying? What do they need? It's not about what you can offer them. It's about what do they need from you and try to understand those needs. And it's really difficult to do that, but you must try. Um, and also there's an acknowledgement that, you know, you can't fix this yourself as an individual, but you can support and you can contribute. Um, and part of that is about raising awareness. And, and I think as, as Margaret's just pointed out, a lot of what I've been involved in is simply that it's listening and raising a awareness, maybe reporting observations um, and also boosting the voices of the leaders um, within our ethnically diverse co communities such as Margaret. You know, we, we all have access to social media and, and I think sharing posts and boosting that that voice is, is important. Um, acknowledging white privilege um, and I think um, this is difficult. This is a difficult area, but it's important. Um, and, and part of the challenge is that as a white person, you may not be aware of that white privilege. And that's certainly a lot of the um, learning that I've been doing is, is, is understanding that um, and listening to the differences that um, colleagues from black and um, ethnically diverse communities um, uh, talk about when they talk about white privilege. Um, engage colleagues in conversation, our white colleagues, you know, um, have face-to-face -face conversations, share social media, share articles, keep talking about it. You know, that that comment um, Margaret made about Black Lives Matter being last year, it's our responsibility to keep that momentum going, to keep these conversations going. And of course, speak up and act, call out behavior. Um, and I think I'm gonna come back and talk a bit more about that, talk about the things that ask you to think about the things that we can do when we go through the case study. So very quickly before we get to that, I want to just talk about some personal responsibilities. And I'm going to flip the order on the slide here. I'm going to talk about people first. Um, and one of the things I talk about when I talk about leadership is seeking out leaders, surround yourself with leaders and learn from them. Um, and I've been really fortunate um, in this space to be surrounded by amazing people. And I'm going to embarrass Margaret because she's one of them. And another um, person is a, is a, is a, um, a colleague called Mo Sata who, who works in Leeds. And I feel really fortunate to have them in their world. And one of the real bonuses is that they're comfortable with me making mistakes around them because I, I learn from that and, and I need to do that. But they also empower me. I remember one of the things that Mo said to me, which actually changed my whole perspective on this, is that he said, Mike, we need white people to help us and our voice won't be heard without you. And actually, um, 
that gave me permission. You shouldn't really need permission, but it gave me permission to speak in this space and be part of it and get involved. Um, and, and, and I've done that and, 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 and I'm not afraid to do that anymore. Um, and, and Margaret mentioned the, the event by Marla and I. Um, and that was a really inspirational event. I learned so much in that event. And, and I'm so pleased to see that that momentum has been picked up by Amanda Howe, who I believe you've already met today. And she's led, taken that into our action plan in the college and a lot of the EDI work that's going on at the RCGP. And I feel very proud to have been involved in that. And I'm very proud to see that it's continuing. Um, and we see this every day, don't we, in, in our lives. And, and I think being empowered to um, intervene is really important. I, I was going to share, a, I'll share it very quickly, a, a story of when I went to the cinema with my family and um, there were some people in front of me um, making very racist comments. There was an advert before the movie started, which had some black people in it and they were making awful comments about it. And and, and, and I felt because of the, the sort of work and the support I had, I felt empowered to say something. So I intervened and it was, it's difficult to do that, but um, it's the right thing to do. Um, Sadly, it didn't make any difference. They continued with the comments and, and, and then I felt I had to act and I went out of the cinema, got the manager, brought them in and, and confronted these people and they were ejected from the cinema. And um, I think that's just a tiny example of the things we can do as allies to, to, to speak up and take action. Um, and I think what I want to do now is um, just move on to the case study. I'm just going to sort of, if we can move on to the next slide, uh, Louise, thank you. So what we're going to try and do for the next 10 minutes or so is split into smaller groups and discuss a case study. And I just want you to think about the issues that the case study um, encompasses and potential actions you might take if you were in that situation. Um, and when you're in your group, you will have a facilitator. And if you could agree who's going to feedback, either uh, the facilitator or, or one of you, please volunteer to feedback. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, I'll just talk through this study. And this is a real case. This, this, this happened in my practice um, just about a year ago, right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and it involved one of my colleagues, a nurse whose background is, her parents were um, from Hong Kong. She's of Chinese heritage, um, and, but she was born in the UK um, and she's a brilliant part of our team. And at the beginning of the um, pandemic, um, patients were refusing to see her because of her appearance. And when they did see her, she was getting comments that she was involved in spreading coronavirus and maybe part of a conspiracy theory to bring it into the UK. And clearly this is incredibly upsetting. You know, she's relatively newly qualified. It was knocking her confidence. Um, she felt that like she didn't want to come to work. And thankfully, she reported it. So she reported it to her line manager and they brought it to me. Um, and my, dil my dilemma then is, okay, what do I do? How do I respond to this in a, in a supportive and meaningful way? And that's what I'd like you to consider in the, in the, short, in the small groups. So we're gonna break up now. I think um, hopefully Louise um, or, or um, one of our colleagues will, will, will separate it into groups and we'll, and we'll discuss that. And we'll come back in about 10 minutes, if that's okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, um, thank you all for contributing. Um, as, as Sham said, the time goes really quickly, doesn't it? But what I thought we could do now, if it's all right with everyone, is just have a very brief feedback from each group and then I'll tell you what actually happened. And we've got a very short video to show you as well. So um, um, I don't know which, which order the groups were, but Sham, are you able to give feedback from your group in, in maybe a minute, if that's okay? Yeah, yeah so we didn't, really, we didn't get that much time to talk about it, but uh, I think... Um, the sort of theme that carried through was about um, trying to change behaviour with reinforcement. So we were saying things that we would try and uh, so we want to understand um, how the clinician felt and what actually happened, words that were used towards them and things like that. But from the patient side, we want to educate them on why what they're doing is wrong, try and reinforce that. And I think we all agreed that we'd be happy to kind of ban the patients from the practice if this was repeated behavior after trying to educate them. Thank you, Sham. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we'll pick up on all of those things, I think, in, in, a, in a little while. Um, Margaret, can you so, feedback yeah, from your group? Thank you. Yeah, so pretty much similar themes there. Uh, the, con the contribution was great. Some Someone, I think it was Catherine, talked about uh, an experience with a, a group um, that felt something similar had happened, but with a with a family where 
they felt quite isolated and to, at one point didn't even want to leave the house. So we tried to look at it from the perspective of how the individual, the victim would feel and then what the practice response could be. And uh, Mariam talked about adopting the zero uh, tolerance um, policy and you know how it's not right. And you know you don't want people to fall into that trap that this is something that's going to continue. So it's about the collective response from the practice. Um, Sally talked about the offering support and a supportive environment. So, because once you've all offered that supportive environment, empowering your colleagues, because how many times does this actually happen uh, and people don't speak up? So it's really important that practices try and adopt these inclusive environments that people feel protected, that they can speak up, but not just speak up, that something will be done about it when they do speak up. So that's where we were coming from. Thanks, Margaret. Thanks, Margaret. And again, I think in our group, um, similar, similar issues. Um, Sarah talked about understanding how confident um, the person wants to challenge the behavior and, and maybe empowering them to do so. Simi talked about um, strength in numbers and getting senior people involved, um, helping to educate patients and empower staff again. Um, and then Madupe took a very um, person-centered approach and was, was talking about how we support the individual and maybe get occupational health involved and just make sure they knew that that support was there. Um, and we also talked about sanctions on patients if the behavior was repeated. So um, I think actually quite similar themes in, in each of the groups. Um, and of course, they're all absolutely right, I think. Um, I wanna talk about now what we did. Um, and we, there was a bit about supporting her and asking her what she wanted and what she wanted actually in this case was support for herself, but to raise awareness. Um, raise awareness amongst our patient population that this was unacceptable and that it was actually happening. So we made a video actually, that was the thing that we did and we and 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 um, I'm going to show you that video in a moment, but it talks about some of the things that you mentioned, particularly the zero tolerance angle to this. And we publicized this video locally on our website um, and it got it got somewhere between 10 and 20,000 views. Um, it was picked up by local TV, national TV, um, and the really important thing was that we didn't get any more incidents with this particular individual. So I'm gonna ask Louise just to play this video. It's only a, a minute or so long, um, and then we'll end the workshop and Sham's gonna speak to you for the, just, just to finish off the session. So I think we'll, um, I, I hope you see that the action we took uh, reflected a lot of the conversation in the workshops. Um, I'm sure we could have done it better. I'm sure there are other things we could have done, um, but um, um, it did have, I think it had a positive effect. Okay, um, I'm gonna hand back to Sham, who will take us through to the end of the session. Thanks, Sham. Thank you. Well, I think we knew that we weren't gonna cover all that we could about um, racism in medicine and general practice and allyship in a 40 minute session. Um, but I hope this is a good standboard to get um, you guys thinking about um, what this all means and how to be better allies for not only other people, but yourselves, um, like in terms of reporting things and getting things done um, and opening other people's eyes and your own eyes to microaggression and racism in the workplace and at university. Um, all your opinions have been really valued and I think I'm going to go away and think about certain things as well and thank you for joining us today. Take care. <laughs>